again, pleasant day to everyone. So this will be the second video for the series on data processing and analysis. And for this, for this video, I will talk about inferential statistics. So again, the learning objectives for the overall learning objectives at the end of the session, the students shall be able to discuss the importance and reasons for correct analysis of data. Describe the steps in analyzing data, choose the appropriate method of analysis, including statistical tests for a given set of data, and interpret indicator statistics and statistical test results. For this second video, at the end of the session, the students shall be able to identify the proper statistical analysis for inferential statistics and write a data processing and analysis for his or her research. So we're finished with descriptive uh, data analysis. We are now going to inferential statistics. So this is an example of data analysis plan I wrote for a drug company sponsored phase four trial. This is for dapagliflacine or for SIGA for, from Astra. So we have three pages of data analysis. So that's how extensive your data analysis should be. So that's how extensive uh, how you write your data analysis should be on your research protocol. Okay. Don't worry, after this lecture, you will be able to write the same uh, data analysis for your research protocol. So for analytic studies, uh, when you say analytic studies, you are looking at inferences. Okay, so these are examples of, of uh, objectives used for analytic studies. So to determine association between social media exposure and body image, to determine correlation between social anxiety score and academic GWA, to determine the effect of OCRA extract on the capillary blood glucose of the patients. So if you have these types of objectives, then you are not describing, okay? You are not describing anymore. You are looking at inference, okay? So for this one, uh, as a review of the previous lecture, so you have to identify what variable are you looking at okay, to be able to determine what statistical test is needed for your research. So for this one, to determine association between social media exposure and body image, again, since we are looking at association, then we are looking at a nominal variable. Okay? Because you cannot compute for association without a two by two table. And when you do two by two table, then those are categorical variables. So the variables here in question is social media exposure and body image. Okay. For this one, to determine correlation between social anxiety score and academic GWA, then we are looking at continuous variables. So social anxiety score is the score of the students on the social anxiety questionnaire, and the academic GWA will be his or her grade. Okay, so you are looking now at correlation between two continuous variables. Okay, and the last, determine the effect of OCRA extract on the capillary blood glucose of the patient. Then this one is also looking at continuous variables. So you're looking at the change before and after OCRA extract uh, uh, application on the capillary blood glucose. Okay, so the capillary blood glucose will be a number. Okay, so a continuous variable. In analyzing data for analytical studies, you have first to review your objectives. So review your specific objectives, especially your hypothesis. And from there, identify the variables used and the scale of measurement, Okay, just like what we did in, in the previous slide. Then you have to compute for the corresponding indicator, whether it's ads ratio, relative least, ARR, number needed to read, number needed to harm. And then compare the indicator or statistics between the study groups, and then perform a proper statistical test of significance of the difference between the groups. Then derive inferences based on this. So your objectives define your inferential analysis. Okay? So if your objective is to determine association, then you are looking at a research design of cross-sectional and case control studies. And the measure for this one is ads ratio. If you are looking at relationship to determine the relationship, then this pertains to cause-effect relationship. And cause-effect relationship can only be uh, done using cohort studies or experimental studies. And the measure for cohort studies and experimental studies is relative risk. Okay. If you are looking, if your if your objective is to determine the magnitude and direction of correlation, then you are looking at correlational study, and the measure is coefficient of correlation. So your research design will dictate what you will need to compute. For case control studies, you compute for ads ratio. 
For cohort studies, you compute for relative risk. For experimental studies, you may compute for uh, preventive value, relative risk, absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction, number needed to treat, and number needed to harm. And for correlational studies, you compute for the coefficient of correlation. Okay. So remember all of these. For cross-sectional studies, I did not place it here. For cross-sectional studies, you can compute for either for prevalence address ratio or prevalence uh, rate ratio. Okay. So remember this one. This is what you need to compute. Okay, so if you're looking at cross-sectional study, then we want to see prevalence as ratio or prevalence rate ratio in your data analysis. If you're if you're doing case control study, we want to see that you are looking that you are that you're going to compute for ads ratio, okay, and so on and so forth. Again, for your two by two table, so we talked about the two by two table during your first year. So when you when you write your do uh, when you do your do two by two table, then you have your outcome at the second and third column. So with positive outcome will be that second column, uh, negative outcome will be the third column, and then exposure risk factor will be on the first column. Okay, so second row will be those with exposure, and third row will be those without the exposure. So this is how you should create your two by two table. So do not interchange and write exposure on, on top and disease on site. Okay, so that will make your two by two table wrong. Okay, and your computation also wrong and your results will not be valid. So always remember your outcome should be on top and your risk factor exposure should be on the site. So how do we interpret for as ratio and relative risk? For as ratio and relative risk, so the interpretation of as ratio and relative risk so if it's equal to one, then there is no association. Okay. If it's greater than one, then it is positively associated. And if it's less than one, then it is negatively associated. Okay. So this will be for prevalence as ratio also and prevalence rate ratio. Okay. For experimental studies, you have to look at the outcome first. So what are examples of positive outcome? Examples of positive outcome is, for example, you are your 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 uh, research is about treatment of pneumonia, then your positive outcome will be that your pneumonia is treated. Okay, So for positive outcome, RR great, uh, less than one, treatment is harmful. RR greater than one, treatment is beneficial. And on RR equal to one, there's no significant difference between the two. If it's a negative outcome, what are negative outcomes? So negative outcomes, for example, for diabetes research, all diabetes research nowadays, it is uh, imperative as, as given by the uh, FDA uh, and uh, European Medicines Agency that all diabetic research should also have as part of their secondary outcomes major adverse coronary events. So major adverse coronary events are negative outcome. We do not want our patients to have uh, myocardial infarction or death, okay, or cardiac death. So those are major advanced coronary events, having cardiac death or uh, acute coronary infarction okay, or stroke for that matter. So these are negative things that we do not want for our patients. So this now becomes negative outcome. Okay. So for negative outcome, are are of equal to one has no significant difference. RR of less than one, treatment is beneficial. And RR of greater than one, treatment is harmful. We also have measures of treatment derived benefit. We have absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. The difference between the two for absolute risk reduction, you only subtract. Okay? But for relative risk reduction, this is a ratio. So determine the statistical test of significance. So what we have first, what you have computed is the effect size. So as racial relative risk and so on and so forth. But you may, but you also want to determine if the result is statistically significant or not. Okay. So to determine what if the result is statistically significant, you have to determine all of these factors. Okay. So what is the study design? What is the scale of measurement used for deriving the indicator? Uh, how many number are, are the study groups or population being compared? And what is the relationship of the study groups 
for the sample population. Okay. So types of sample uh, for, for the relationship. So when you look at relationship of study groups or sample population, uh, for the number of study groups or population being compared to either two groups, three groups, or three or more groups. Okay. For the relationship, we have related and not related. Okay, so what do you mean by related and not related? When you say related, then you are looking at before and after studies. Okay, just like the example before, the effect of okra on capillary blood glucose. So you have the capillary blood glucose before uh, giving okra and capillary glucose after giving uh, okra. So these are related because you are looking at the same subject. So you have two measurements for the same subject before and after uh, giving the treatment. Okay, so this is now considered as related. Okay, independent or not related, you are looking at, or you are comparing two different groups. Example, you for 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 the area, you are looking at one patient will be given uh, probiotics, for example, uh, esbolardi, and the other. Uh, the other patient will be given uh, bacillus clausi. Okay, so you're now comparing and the effect that you want is cessation of diarrhea. So you are now looking at two different groups. It's not the same subject. We have two different subjects. One is given uh, bacillus clausi and one is given S. polardi. And you're looking at how many patients uh, are treated properly or have positive outcome with Escolarity versus those with positive outcome on uh, bacillus clausi. So you are now looking at independent subjects. Okay. So remember, during the first lecture, uh, the first video, I talked about uh, the variables used. So this is why I talk about the variables being used. Okay? Because this is important in determining what type of test will you use to determine statistical significance, okay? So for the second column, you are looking at interval or ratio. So if your variables are continuous variables, then use all of these tests. If your variables are ordinal variables like pain score or like your scale, then use this statistical test. And if your variables are nominal variables, example, uh, gender, then use these types of tests. Now, how are, you, how are you going to determine now which of these tests are you going to use? Okay, so if it's a single population or group, so this is mostly for descriptive statistics, you will use C-test or T-test for interval ratio, Smirnov sample test or RANS test for ordinal, and binomial test for nominal. Okay, for two population, so you have to determine the relationship for the two population, is it related or independent, as I have discussed a while ago? So if it's a related sample, if it's continuous variable, you use paired t-tests. If it's independent, you use independent t-tests. If they are ordinal variables, then use will concern much pair tests for a related sample and man with new tests for independent sample. For nominal variables, you use McNamara's test for related sample and Fisher exact test or chi-square test for uh, independent samples. For three or more related samples, so if you have three or more groups, then it's very, very easy. So you only use ANOVA. So all of these are, these are different types of ANOVA, okay? But all of these are ANOVA, okay? For a nominal variable, again, you use chi-square test, okay? For correlational studies, if it's a continuous variable, you use Pearson's R. If it's an ordinal variable, use Spearman's rank. And for nominal variables, you use kappa test. So this is an example of summary table, table one for cohort and experimental studies. For cohort and experimental studies, you want to compare the two outcomes. Okay, So you want to ensure that the two outcomes are similar at the beginning of the study. So when you are comparing the two outcomes at the beginning of the study, then you look for there if there is a statistical significant difference between the two. And uh, it will now depend on what are the variables being used as uh, determined by the table bef before. Okay, So for continuous variables, again, for continuous variables like age, 
you use independent T-tests. Why? Because these are two different groups. These are not related groups. So for H, this H, since H is a continuous variable, you use independent T-tests. Gender is a nominal variable. So you use chi-square test or Fisher exact test. When do you use chi-square test and when do you use Fisher exact test? So if the total of the 2 by 2 table is less than 20, or if any of the square of the 2 by 2 table is less than 5, then you use Fisher exact test. But if all of the squares are more than 5 and the total is more than 20, then you use chi-square test. For pain score, so since pain score is an ordinal variable, then you use man whitney u test. Okay? So I hope you remember all of these tests. Okay, so you can now uh, forego of the uh, table that I've shown you a while ago because it's really, really hard to uh, memorize those tables. But you can memorize this test, okay, because this will be the test that you will use. Okay, so again, I'm going pairing. If there is statistically significant difference between the two groups, since these are independent groups, then for continuous variables, use independent t-test. For ordinal variables, use man whitney And for nominal variables, use chi-square Fisher exact test. So this is an example of a table, a summary one table. So we're comparing the treatment group and placebo group at the beginning. So baseline data. So you're looking at their baseline data. Okay. So for the p-value for age, again for this one, we use independent t-test for the p-value for age. Okay. So years living with arthritis is again continuous variable. So number of years. So p-value is again independent t-test. For the type of arthritis, uh, since the number of samples is the total is less than 20, and these are nominal variables, then we use Fisher exact test for this one. Okay? For the gender, male or female, again, the total value is less than 20, so we use Fisher exact test. Okay? For the baseline pain score, so baseline pain score, uh, since base pain score is ordinal variable, then we use uh, man whitney u test for this one okay so in this one this is statistically significant because it is less than 0 0.05 so if it's statistically significant then it means that at baseline there's a difference between the pain score of those in the treatment group and those in the placebo group so why do we want to determine if there is a statistically significant difference at baseline because this can affect your uh, this can affect your results, okay? So, for example, for this one, the treatment group, the mean score is 6, while for the placebo group, the mean score is 4, and there is a statistically significant difference between the two, meaning most of those in the treatment group usually have a high median score, and those on the placebo group usually have a, high, a low median score. So what does this uh, connotes? So it means that if you're going to, compute for the statistically significant difference between the two before and after. So if you're looking at the pain score after the treatment, you can already determine from this one that the treatment group will always have a higher uh, or larger uh, difference in score. Okay, Why? Because if both patients will have no pain after treatment, then you are assured that those in the treatment group will have a high a, uh, difference in score of six. And while in the placebo group, the difference in score, the highest will only be four. Okay. So if you compare the difference, you will now say that treatment group has a higher uh, decrease in the pain score as compared to placebo group. But this is invalid because from the beginning, the treatment group will always have a higher uh, difference in pain score. Okay. So you must be careful about this one. Okay, so make sure that when you randomize your subjects, that you randomize them properly so that there will be an equal distribution of the pain score. If your objective is magnitude and direction of correlation, then this is what uh, your uh, data analysis should look like. Okay, so you use a uh, correlation coefficient uh, and your forest plot. Okay. Ah, sorry, not forest plot, scatter plot. Okay. So the scatter plot is, is used uh, to determine the direction of the correlation. 
So the direction of correlation will be this one. So this will be a positive correlation as it's the line of reference here will be going up. Okay. And then to determine the magnitude, use Pearson's R for continuous variables and Spearman's row for ordinal variable. If your objective is to determine the association, so most of you will have an objective of determining the association, then this is how your results should look like. So positive outcome, negative outcome, again, outcome should be on top and the risk factor should be on the side, okay? So compute for the effect size first before the p-value. So never ever interpret association or relationship using the p-value alone. We always see that uh, during your third year, during the research forum. So some students will say that there is a statistically significant association because the p-value is less than 0 0.05. But they did not compute for the odds ratio. So how do you know that there is an association if you did not compute for the odds ratio? The p-value will only say that there is a statistically significant difference between the two. But it will not tell you, it will not tell you if there is an association or not. And if there is an associa association, the p-value will not tell you if it's a positive association or a negative association. So to determine positive or negative association, you need to compute for the odds ratio or the relative risk. Okay. So to determine significance, use Fisher exact test. Again, if total is less than 20 or if n to the square is less than 5. For example, for this one, uh, for the square on positive outcome and positive risk factor, the number is only 2, so that's less than 5. So for this one, the p-value to be used is... Uh, Fisher exact test. You also need to compute for the 95% confidence interval, as I will tell you later on why. So for example, for this one, what will be your interpretation for this one? Okay, Some will interpret this as there, there is a significant association between aerial insecticide and lung cancer. Okay, Why? Because the p-value is less than 0 0.01. Okay. So there is a statistically significant difference. So now, this interpretation is wrong. Okay, Why? Because even if the p-value is less than 0 0.01, you must look at the as ratio. The as ratio is 1.01, .01, meaning the as ratio is equal to 1. So again, if the as ratio is equal to 1, it means that there is no association. If it is greater than 1, there is a positive association. If it is less than 1, there is a negative association. But this one is equal to 1. So if it's equal to 1, then the interpretation, the proper interpretation should be that there is no association between aerial insecticide and lung cancer, and the result is statistically significant. Okay? So I hope you understand this one, and I hope that on your third year, we will not see this, the first interpretation on your third year. Okay? So do not mistake the p-value as a... Uh, measure of association. The p-value is just a measure of significance and not a measure of association. So this is another example comparing sexual practices or engaging in sex and sexual knowledge. So for this one, there is a negative association as seen on your uh, prevalence rate ratio. So there is a negative association meaning those who uh, have inadequate knowledge are the ones who practice more sex or engage more in sex. Okay? But the result is not statistically significant okay? because the p-value is more than 0 0.05. Okay? So for experimental study showing effectiveness or efficacy, you have to compute for the relative risk and the number needed to treat. Okay? So use chi-squared test or Fisher exact test again for significance. For experimental studies showing adverse events, so if you're looking at adverse, uh, for all experimental studies, the fourth objective should always be to determine uh, adverse events. Okay, so for adverse events, you need to compute for number needed to harm and the risk ratio. Okay, so again, use chi-squared or Fisher exact test for significance. For objective showing effect, so when you say effect, you are looking at before and after. So what is the effect of intervention on that particular uh, outcome? Okay, so for this one, you have to have two computations. So you have to have two tables for this one. Okay, so the first table will be comparing baseline versus post intervention. 
Okay, so you have two treatments, treatment A and treatment B. So what is the baseline uh, baseline out, uh, baseline uh, parameter? And what is the post-intervention parameter? Then compute for the difference. So for example, if this is capillary blood, uh, this is okra for capillary blood glucose, so treatment A is okra, treatment B this is placebo. So what is the baseline capillary blood glucose level? And what is the post-intervention after giving placebo and after giving uh, okra? Okay. Then compute for the mean difference. Okay, so for example, the baseline for uh, okra is uh, 180, and the post intervention for okra is 90. Then the mean difference is 90. Then compute for the p value. Okay, so that's how you do that. But the first table will only show you uh, that there is a statistically significant effect uh, by 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 each treatment. But you also want to determine which treatment is better. Okay? So if you want to determine which treatment is better, whether it's treatment A or treatment B, then you now need to compute the mean difference. Uh, compare the mean difference. So this one, the mean difference here, you place that there and then get the difference and then get the p-value. Okay? So this is how you will write. So determine if there is significant difference pre- and post-intervention use. Per TTS will be used for continuous variables like blood pressure, fasting blood, fasting blood sugar, etc. And will coxon match per test will be used for ordinal variables like pain score. To determine if there is a significant difference in the mean difference of the two interventions used, so this is for this table, uh, independent T-test is used for continuous variables and man whitney u test is used for ordinal variables. Okay, So you must remember this test. So this is the exact test that you will use to determine statistical significance, okay? So example, this one, effectiveness of supplementary chicken uh, program in reducing blood pressure. Okay, so this is the first table that I told you a while ago. So this is the baseline and the final, okay? So baseline and final for treatment and for control. So this is the difference 18 and 4.17. And this is the p-value for that one. Okay, for the diastolic BP, and uh, here's the p-value for that one. Okay. There are some statistical issues on the p-value. So the uh, significant finding does not mean that the results did not occur chance. It only means that only that it is unlikely that the findings did occur by chance. And a significant finding does not mean that there is no association, only that it is highly unlikely that there is an association. Okay? The p-value only evaluates the role of chance. They say nothing about other alternative explanations or about causality. P-values reflect the strength of association and the study sample size. A large sample size may not reflect statistical significance even, even if there is one, and a small sample size may reflect statistical significance even if there is none. So as you can see by this one, the p-value is affected by the sample size. Okay, So to counteract this issue on the sample size, we address this by calculating for the confidence interval. Okay, the confidence interval gives all the information of a p-value plus the expected range of effect sizes. Okay. So the confidence interval indicates the range within which the true magnitude effect lies with a certain degree of assurance. The degree of assurance is defined by the p-value you assign. Okay. So this is an example of the confidence interval. If the line of reference, if the range uh, cross the line of reference, then there is no statistically significant difference. But if the range does not uh, cross the line of reference, then there is a statistically significant difference. Okay. You must also be careful when uh, interpreting your, your results. Okay. So the results may be statistically significant, but it is not clinically significant. So you must remember also to look at the actual score and correlate it clinically. Will this have an effect clinically on my patients? For example, for this one, summary of the comparison of mean size reduction in lesions of tinea corporis before and after two weeks of treatment using per t test. So if you would look at this one, this author, uh, the resident, this is a, a resident uh, of UERM, concluded that there is a statistically significant difference uh, in the 
mean size reduction using ketoconazole and that ketoconazole is effective as a is an effective treatment and he, uh, she recommended the use of ketoconazole for tinea corporis but if you would look at the mean size reduction in centimeters this is in centimeters okay so this is the mean size before treatment is 6 the mean size after treatment is 5.79 and the mean size reduction is 0.21 you must remember 0.21 cm how large is 0.21 cm okay will that really have an effect clinically on the patient can you now say to the patient that this drug is very, very effective because this drug will decrease your lesion by 0.21 centimeters? How much is 0.21 centimeters? It's not even one centimeter. It's 0.21 centimeters. That's very, very minuscule. And you may not, you may not see a difference clinically with a 0.21 centimeter difference. Okay? So... Please be careful when you recommend. Okay, make sure that when you do re your recommendation, you are not looking uh, only at the numbers or at the statistical significance, but also at the clinical significance of your results. So, how to write? So, this is how I wrote for the DAPA for SIGA, uh, DAPA Gliflustine study. Okay, so for the treatment exposure, uh, daily dose of glipagliflucine with uh, etc. etc. So there, analysis of the main variables. And so nakalagay na siyan. So for the variables, we use repeated measures ANOVA with multiple uh, comparison using DUNETS correction. Okay. So I will tell you about repeated measures ANOVA later on. Okay. So this is how we handle missing values, then uh, adverse events. Okay. So that's how you are going to write your data analysis. Okay. So this is another example of how I write a data analysis. Uh, this is for quality of life of diabetes. Okay, so quality of life of type 2 diabetes patients. So for the patient demographic, so this is descriptive. Very wrote, patient demographic will be described by means of absolute and relative frequencies for categorical variables and mean standard deviation, minimum, maximum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For the analysis of my main variables, I wrote that for quality of life of diabetic patients, this is the data processing scoring system will follow the developer's instruction and scoring interpretation. This is very very important. Okay, so you must also write down how you are going to interpret the questionnaires. If you are using questionnaires, then you have to write down how you are going to interpret the questionnaire. So for this one, I wrote that for quality of life, I will follow the instructions of the developer for the questionnaire. Okay, the admission of the scores will be used as these are ordinal variables. For compliance and adherence of medication, the scoring interpretation of the uh, uh, brief medication questionnaire will be followed. Okay, again, for the data processing, I follow the uh, instruction of the authors. Mission of the scores will be used as these are ordinal variables. For association, prevalence rate ratio will be used. And for the statistical significance, either chi-square test or Fisher exact test will be used as appropriate. 95% confidence interval will also be computed. For the correlation, Pearson's R will be used to determine the magnitude. A scatter plot will be used to determine direction of the correlation. And 95% confidence interval will also be computed. A p-value of less than 0 0.05 will be deemed as statistically significant. Okay, So this now is a, compute, is a complete data analysis, data processing and analysis statement. So I have statement on data processing on how I will process the data. And I also have statements on data analysis, on what statistical tests I will use and what effect size I will compute. Okay, So I hope that this is how you will now write your data analysis after uh, the lecture. Okay. For multivariate analysis, what I have discussed so far are two groups only. Okay, So all of those tables are looking at two groups. So, But sometimes you have three or more groups in your uh in your study okay so if you are going to compare two or more variants if it's a before and after studies you should use repeated measures ANOVA okay what is a before and after studies for example you are looking at the effect again uh for example effect of of what 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 do you want for example you want to uh determine again I mean 
can use okra. You want to determine the effect of okra on the blood pressure. Okay, so you're giving okra extract to the patients uh, every day for one month, and then you're going to measure the blood pressure of the patient weekly. Okay, so you have the baseline, then you give the okra extract every day for one month, then weekly you have measurements of blood pressure. Since you have four sets of data, so you have a five, five sets of data for one month. So you have baseline, first week, second week, third week, and fourth week. So that is not uh, two groups anymore. So that's how many? So one, two, three, four, five. So you have five sets of data. So you have five groups. So for that one, since you have five groups and you're looking at before and after measures, so you are now going to use repeated measures ANOVA okay, for the computation of the statistical significance. For independent variables, so you can use one or two-way ANOVA. Okay, so difference example of this is difference between three types of pain reliever or difference between three types of pain reliever and different sides of pain. Okay, so for example, you are comparing three types of pain reliever and want to determine difference in the pain scores. So which of the three uh, three types of pain reliever will have a higher uh, pain score uh, reduction? Okay, so you are now going to use one or two way ANOVA for that. For the post hoc analysis, when you use ANOVA, you always need to conduct a post hoc analysis, okay? especially if there is a statistically significant difference in the ANOVA. Uh, post hoc analysis uh, will be done to compare the different groups. Because remember, you have three groups. For example, for the three types of pain reliever and three types of pain score and three pain score, you have you are comparing three groups. So even if you uh, determine a statistical significance between the results, you are now not sure which group has a statistically significant difference. It is treatment A versus treatment B or treatment B versus treatment C or treatment A versus treatment C. Okay. So that's the importance of post hoc analysis to determine which among these have a statistically significant difference. So if you're going to compare every mean to a control mean, then use do nets or homes. If you're going to compare every mean to every other mean, then use Tuki, Bonferroni, Dan, or CDAC, Bonferroni. I usually use Tuki or Dunet. Okay? Kruskal, Wallis, or Friedman's. So if you have three or more groups and you are looking at ordinal variables, oh, I'm sorry, don't use the pain score before because pain score is continuous. Pain score should be for this one. So if you're looking at pain score, uh, for, for the first one, use blood pressure. Okay, So blood pressure is continuous variable. For this one, ordinal variable, then use either Kruskal-Wallis or Friedman's. Okay? So use Friedman's test for match or paired groups, so before and after, or Kruskal-Wallis for independent groups. Okay, So again, this is used for rank or non-parametric test. And for post hoc analysis, you use Dan's test. So dance test is different from donuts, okay? So what is parametric versus parametric? I'll always see this amongst the uh, third year uh, students. They will say that their, their data is non-parametric or skewed. Okay, so what do we mean by parametric and non-parametric? This is a normal set of data. So for this is the normal bell curve, okay? So if your data produces a normal bell, bell, bell curve, then this is a parametric data. But if your data is skewed to the right or skewed to the left, then that is a non-parametric data. Okay. So how do you compute if your data is normal? So you compute for Gaussian distribution, and you can use any of these tests. You can use the Agostino Pearson Omnibus Normality Test or the Shapiro Wilk Normality Test. I usually use the Shapiro normal Wilk Normality Test to determine Gaussian distribution. Okay. If the result is less is greater than 0 0.05, then the distribution is normal because there is no significant difference among the data variables. Okay. You also have MANOVA and ANCOVA. If you're going to do multivariate analysis of, of variance, so you are looking at variance. So you want to determine if there's a difference in the variance. This is not the actual numbers anymore, the actual outcome, but the variance. So if you're looking at variance, uh, and if you use three or more independent dependent variables, then use uh, MANOVA. Okay, and COVA is inclusion of one or more covariate variables. Okay, 
Repeated measures ANOVA, I have already told you about this one. So use repeated measures ANOVA if you're looking at the same outcome example, as I've said earlier, comparing BP weekly after the intervention. If you want to analyze the relationship uh, of significant factors associated with the outcome, uh, you can either use linear regression or logistic regression. So do not interchange these two. Okay? So if your dependent variables are quantitative variables, example, weight, age, gravity, or parity, then use linear regression. Okay? But if your variables are qualitative variables, example, gender, uh, drug abuse, drinking, yes or no, so if it's answerable by yes or no, then that's a qualitative variable, then use logistic regression. If you want to compare survival rate, then you can use any of these tests. You can use survival analysis, kaplan mayer survival curves, Lagrange test, or Cox professional hazards model. According to George Dyke, do not just cut out the appropriate part of the computer output and paste into the draft of the paper but read it through and conduct what additional calculations are suggested by the original analysis. So do not ever, ever put a statistical table on your results on your third year. Okay, Just like this one, they have value, degrees of freedom, exact sig, exact sig one-sided. Okay, So your readers will not be able to understand this one. Okay, So as presented for the data presentation, you, you present data so that your readers will be able to uh, understand, analyze, and interpret your data. So if you're going to present it to your this to your readers, then they will never understand this data. Okay, so don't use statistical tables on your results. Okay. So in summary, I have discussed how to conduct inferential analysis and what statistical test to use and how to write a statistical analysis for your research paper. So thank you very much for listening. Do not forget to listen to the third lecture on how to analyze qualitative studies. And remember, please consult your advisors.